Hey everybody, welcome to today's presentation, Countdown to Q4, Top Tips for Building More and Better Pipeline Now. Um, I'm gonna be your moderator, my name is Jamie, I work at Ambition. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we get started and as people are piling in, we will send a recording. Um, never would we do this and not give you that recording, so check your email when we're done and uh, that'll be waiting for you, so if you need to hop off, don't worry. Um, also, you're going to be muted, so if you have a burning question, type that directly into the chat box or the Q&A. Um, we will get those questions at the end, so we're going to go through, have our conversation. Um, if you type something in, I may not see it until I'm ready to look at it, so don't worry. I'll try my best. Um, yeah, and then we're going to... We're gonna get going here. So I wanna introduce our speakers first, just to kind of walk you through. I'll introduce the speakers. Um, I'm gonna give you just a just kind of high level five minute why we're talking about this, and then we'll hop into our conversation and your questions and all that jazz. Okay, so here we go. So our speakers today, Lars. Lars Wold, am I saying that correctly? That's correct. Wonderful, so we have Lars Wold. He's the SVP of sales at DialSource. Tell us more, what is DialSource, Lars? Dial Source is a native CTI solution in Microsoft Dynamics as well as Salesforce. We are the number one rated CTI solution on the Salesforce App Exchange. We enable sales teams to be more effective, efficient, have better conversations that deliver better results. Um, and we do that all through your CRM. So if you're doubling down on your investment of your CRM system as your platform, the single version of, of the truth where you want everybody to work, live, and breathe, we can help. We can help connect conversation and capture data that drive better analytics to make better decisions, as we're gonna talk about later today. I love it. And then also joining us is a partner and friend, Rob Solberg, he's the SVP of Sales and Partnerships for Jump Crew. Um, Rob, tell us more about Jump Crew. Thanks, sure. So, um, uh, right, Rob Solberg, uh, Senior Vice President of Sales and Partnerships at Jump Crew. So we do two things for our clients at Jump Crew. Uh, we do marketing and sales. Uh, on an outsourced basis, but, but Jump Crew is unique in that uh, we're what we call a digital first sales organization, uh, meaning that we use data driven uh, digital marketing strategies to enable our outsourced and uh, white labeled salespeople to help companies fill their pipelines and uh, acquire new customers. So thanks for the opportunity, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. And last but certainly not least, we have Jared Houghton. He is the co-founder, one of the co-founders and uh, the CRO at Ambition. And I'm going to try and give you, he wanted me to give you the marketing version of what we do. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, <laughs> am I? Um, but we are the number one sales performance management software. So we transform sales teams into powerful revenue engines. Um, so from coaching and analytics to TVs in your sales pitch, uh, contests, you know, you name it, competitions, we help you you know, we give you the tools to make it easy for sales leaders to draw really smart insights from the data that you already have and activate and create a culture on the sales floor of wins, of hitting goals, of hitting targets, um, so that every rep on your team is driving measurable, um, predictable revenue um, day to day. And so you hit your goals. How'd I do? Is that okay? What a miss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and these are, these well are two done. fantastic partners <laughs> yeah. uh, to do that, of course. Yeah. There you go. Here we go. Yes, and Dalsource yes, uses this as well. So we, we, we do it all, folks. Um, well, so like I said, I'm going to tee up just a little bit. So today we're talking about Q4, Q1, ending your year strong and the things you need to do to get there. Um, but why is that important? So have a couple little slides because I am on the marketing team. Um, so why are we talking about 2020 today? Why does it matter? Um, well, obviously, as you all know, we've got to build pipeline now so that we actually have someone to sell to later. So the average, uh, you know, B2B sales, um, sales cycle is around three months. And for more substantial deals, deals that are going to require a few more stakeholders and just, you know, process, that's going to be six to nine months. So it's crucial in these sort of lazy, hot summer months that we stay focused and that we make sure that we are building pipeline that is going to convert later on or we're going to be crying in Q1 and Q2. Um, but it's really hard. So almost half of your sales team says that prospecting is the hardest part of their job. So more than qualifying, more than closing, actually just finding the right person, finding right people to have conversations with is, it's, it sucks. I'll say that. Um, it's not always easy and it can be really disheartening and it's not really the thing you necessarily want to do 
when it's hot and humid outside, right? Um, also, we've got another huge challenge, and that's that the majority of sales teams, so Harvard Business Review did a study um, and found that almost half of sales teams don't have some sort of formalized playbook or process. Um, and it actually is incredibly detrimental. Um, the top performing teams that, that, they, uh, that they surveyed, over half all had a really strict sort of process that they follow for success and the others were kind of flailing in the wind. Of those though that didn't have a process, they checked back in. The ones that started to do this, that took their advice, saw on average 28 to 30 percent lifts in revenue. So just by implementing that, they saw immediate uh, business wins. So proof is there. Um, one of the biggest challenges though, and we see it a lot with our customers and I'm sure it's true of of Jump Crew and Dialsource as well. Um, in sales, uh, a good salesperson sometimes doesn't stay a good salesperson forever. They get elevated to leadership positions. We want them to make more of them. We want to sell more stuff and, and they've got the goods. Um, but what happens is that a lot of times they are not receiving necessarily the guidance and training that they need. So um, how can we expect our sales managers to deliver um, pipeline and know how to run a business just because they themselves knew how to sell things. So that's another huge challenge that we can, can talk about today. Um, oops, got ahead of myself. Um, and all of that sort of lack of process, lack of training leads to a lack of efficiency. So salespeople are not spending their time on the phone selling. They are spending, you know, less than 40% of their time actually doing the thing we need them to do because they're a little scattered and there isn't a process, um, which also leads to just poor prioritization overall of working the pipeline that we already have. So generating new stuff is hard, but we don't know how to work the pipeline that we've already got. Um, and 62% of B2B companies say that just their biggest challenge is lead gen. Um, it's our ongoing job and struggle. You know, I'll be working on some other project and then it's like, oh wait, okay, we gotta, you know, be reactive and, and move. And so it's the, the constant back and forth and it's a goal that really the entire company owns. Um, but, you know, who really owns it? Sales and marketing. But they don't get along. A tale as old as time, Beauty and the Beast. I'll let you decide who's who. Um, <clears throat> uh, one in four companies say that their sales and marketing teams are not aligned. And it's not really because they don't like each other. It's just that they have different ideas of what quality looks like, what the conversation looks like, and a lack of communication is happening. So all that in summary, we, we have poor processes, we have poor prioritization, um, generating pipelines is just hard to do, and then the teams that are responsible really for pulling the weight don't agree on what needs to happen. So guys, we got a lot of problems to solve today, um, but I'm really confident that you can do this. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna go just to the four of us. We're gonna hash it out. We're gonna spit some knowledge. I'm gonna start with you, Rob. Um, who's, who's, who's Beauty and the Beast? Do we need to Let's go Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we'll do a poll. I'm well, already getting Mark and you send an email out, and you guys, you just let <clears> it. I think, I think, I think the sales guys know who, who's who. Uh, I like the, I like the idea of a poll. It's good. It's good exercise. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. We'll do that later. Um, but I want to go ahead and hop to the questions. We do have a lot to get to. So, um, you know, obviously the whole thing, I feel like it's sort of this, this domino effect, that lack of process. This is something that I know you Rob, the, your clients come to you largely because they're like, we, we need a team. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> help us, help us figure it out. Help us scale this. So in your estimation, you know, why do you think so many teams are not adopting a process? Why is that so hard to do? And really, what can teams do to start doing that today? Like, what's, a, what's an entry point into just getting a playbook and sticking to it? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there are two really big uh, pieces here why people struggle with process. I think number one, um, it's just a lack of acknowledgement or general understanding that process is critical to planning and scale. Um, and I, I think that that's just an unfortunate state, state of affairs uh, that people don't really understand that process keeps everyone organized and moving quickly. Um, I think the other thing is that there's a lot of uh, general misunderstanding about who owns the process. Um, if you're in a company that's pretty large, maybe you have an ops team and a sales ops team, in which case that's great. They're probably owning the process. Um, but whether you've got an ops team or not, I believe that process definitely starts with sales leadership. 
um, because we're the closest to the action. Um, so the process needs to be sort of born uh, from our ideas and experiences. So, so if you don't have a process in place as a sales leader, you know, my recommendation would be to look at your own process as a sales professional um, and, and write it down. Uh, look at what it takes to get a deal from, you know, lead to cash and compare that with your top performers. Um, identify any commonalities um, to work towards standardizing the process, uh, roll it out, train against it. Uh, and make people stick to it because I think that efficiency comes from, you know, process and everybody's sticking to it. And that's where uh, deals begin flowing at the same pace because everybody's using the same process. <clears throat> totally. Well, and, you know, when we talk about process and just sort of like, what does that mean? What are the components of it? What are the actual elements on a daily basis, um, the tools, the, you know, we'll get into that a little bit more, but, you know, what is sort of like the best multi-channel approach? I mean, that's kind of a huge question, but what are those elements that a, a sales team or a sales manager needs to be aware of and need, you know, that those reps really need to be using at their disposal? You know, this is a mix of, is it more email? Is it more time on the phone? You know, when the chips are down, what, what do we do? And this is kind of an open question to everyone. Um, you know, what is that silver bullet? What does it look like? Or is there a silver bullet? Silver bullets are, are pretty <laughs> tough. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there is. Yeah. Um, I mean, the process is always multifaceted. It's it's how did they get to us? Who's marketing to them? Was it a cold call from an SDR? Is this an old opportunity that they buy from us before? There's so many different ways the process can be affected. Um, you know, for me, like I think about our SDR team and, and someone that's that's engaged with our marketing content, be that net new or they've known about us for a while and been following that. One of the most critical things we coach you in the process is our, our time to first conversation. So if someone comes into our, our marketing web, however that may be, you know, and there's tons of studies out there, but we see so much impact in that, that first call. So, so if, if we can coach to those things that really drive the further process down the funnel, you know, marketing did their job. They got them to, to the website. Okay. Um, it's now, and they're far down the path, most likely, probably 60% of the way. So, so for the process for ambition, starting with sales with SDR, we're really focused on how fast can we get them on the phone? Can we understand their problems? And how do we quickly build a, a great experience for them to start talking to our sales team? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think time to engagement is important, but there's more structure to that process. What we did when I joined Dial Source is we took the whole customer lifecycle process from from an MQL all the way to an SQL to an SDR, converting that to, to, a, to an opportunity through the AE community all the way to the implementation team. But that whole map has to be drawn out mm -hmm. and measured along the way. <clears throat> the only way to, to really effectively do that is you do need process, but you need discipline in the process as well. So the structure around what, what's really popular right now that we see is most companies want not just that first call, Jared, and we see five minutes is the number. Mm -hmm. Right. We want to hit yep. if somebody comes in on online, our SDR community, their number one job is to con initial contact within five minutes. But once they get them in that initial contact, then they go into a cadence of structured activities. What marketing content are we going to drip and send after that? You know, first when they hit the e when they hit the website, do they get an email? Then do they get a call? And then that puts them based on that campaign or that initiative, it puts into a structured communication. When is the next call? What's the next piece of content? What's the message? Certainly that can be adjusted and modified based on that qualification question or those questions, but we're structuring things, you know, 15, 20 touches over 21, 30 days. But it's just not about the first call, Jared, to your point. Speed to lead is really important. But then what, what it, you know, are people giving up too soon? Are people staying the course? And are people having really good conversations with those candidates to understand the messaging that's going to be most important to them? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, okay. and Lars, I, I'd, I'd love to get your feedback because I think it's sort of piggyback piggybacks on this a little bit is that I think a lot of salespeople spend um, like an obnoxious amount of time filling their pipelines with uh, either unqualified or poorly qualified opportunities. So when, when it comes to further down the funnel, they're, they're spending an enormous amount of time chasing deals that, that are right at the finish line but are never intended to close. So my opinion is that if salespeople spend more energy unqualifying earlier in the sales process, they could save an enormous amount of time on the back end and have more time to invest in opportunities that have a much higher likelihood to close. It would probably end up being better customers long term. I don't know if you feel a similar sentiment. Well, I'm 100% adamant about qualifying deals out 
takes as much structure as qualifying deals forward, right? It's, you cannot waste your time on a deal you're never going to close. But I would also push that back to the marketing team, right? So even in email forms, they say between four and five fields, you can get people up to maybe eight, you can get people to, to submit information before you receive an inbound uh, request. Make sure that your at least your minimum qualifications are there, so you're not mm -hmm. spending time out of the gate. And then, you know, we have a structure where the SDRs have some minimum qualifications, not just BANT, but some other things that are relevant to why we win that we've learned over time that we require in that initial discussion before an SDR schedules a discovery call with an account exec to have a conversation with the customer. If we can qualify out there, yes, it's disheartening to the SDR, but it's the right thing for the business. And then once it goes into the, in, in, into the AE, how effectively are you managing those folks? Are you looking at their pipelines? How many deals you qualify in? How many deals you qualify out? There's as good a value as qualifying deals out of your funnel because you don't have enough time. You saw almost 70% of the sales reps' time is doing administrative stuff. Mm -hmm. I would equate 20 to 30% of that as working deals, to your point, that are never going to close. There's simply not mm -hmm. time. Well, and I yeah, think that that – brings us to a really good next point where we're talking about obviously improving efficiency. Lars has, you know, tons of experience with talking about like, Hey, we had to go in and break this down and say five minutes is the key. What, you know, like I said, we have a huge problem with managers not being managed rather, or we're just sort of expecting them to magically know um, how to take that giant goal. Now um, they may have been really good at managing their day, but they don't know how to work backwards from sort of the North Star. Um, this is something I know we talk about a lot, Jared. I'm not like putting you on the spot. Um, I'm just, I'm totally taken back <laughs> by this question that came in. Uh, regarding oh, I know, I know. I, I tried, sh I don't know if everyone can see it, actually. So I might, I might hold on to that. He's, get, he's getting compliments, let's <laughs> just say that. Rob is get it. Rob's got an admirer and I'm, I, it's anonymous. So take that. I'm One. I'm frankly jealous. I think probably, we know who the beauty is. Probably, so. probably my wife. <laughs> she joined. Good. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Rob is the smartest one on the panel. Um, yeah. So, so but it, my next question would just naturally be, how do we coach these managers to identify what that sort of weak spot is in the process? So maybe we have a process. We think it's good. Um, the time to reply being a huge one I, I, in a past sales job that I had, I remember ours was like, you know, 15 minutes and it went to five, six, you know, whatever. It, we constantly were watching that. Um, but then it blossomed into what Lars was talking about where you've got to know, um, you know, the quality the you have to get as granular as did we put the right, you know, form on the right page, you know, did this blah, blah, blah. So how do you sort of coach a manager to be innately aware of where the weak spot is in the process once you have one. Yeah, I don't know if that was for me or not, but yeah, yeah. I, think, I think Lars spelled that out extremely well. I mean, there's so many things that have to happen as you move you know, a lead into the process. And I think unqualifying is a huge mm -hmm. coaching opportunity. And ultimately, everyone's trying to close revenue. Everyone wants to do that. But the, the, the ways that I and that Lars and others are coaching those reps is working backwards from each of those steps. Like, Hey, I have a great pipeline. Um, well, let's look at it. All right. 70% of that's unqualified. Okay. That's a coaching opportunity to talk about why these things aren't real pipeline opportunities. And of course, moving that forward to what are the real ones? How are we focusing on getting those next steps, which ultimately is going to continue the process down to close one revenue for the business. And ultimately, you know, a better relationship between that rep and that manager being open to coaching. It's understanding, yeah. hey, I did this as a rep, but but as a leader, here's how I coach that rep to now, you know, understand what you did naturally that really worked, mm -hmm. working that backwards, teaching them how to actually coach to that and, and unpeeling that process every step of the way. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the modern sales leader needs tons of, of tech to do that. We all represent technology companies or companies that provide a specific service around enablement and making sure that these leaders have what they they need. Um, so outside of just a CRM that's holding all the data and good data hygiene and people tracking things effectively, uh, which is Hopefully. what I love. I could talk about that all day. Um, what are, what, what is that kind of that modern sales deck look like? What do you need to you know, take that process, digitize it, and actually make it something actionable. And I know Rob, we sort of chatted about this. Um, what does that What does that mix look like when 
sit down with a client, like if, you know, look at what they're using, like what would you say they absolutely have to have? Sure. So, so I feel pretty fortunate at Jump Crew because we support so many clients of different shapes and sizes and verticals and categories that I've, I've touched like almost every sales tool that's out there. So I feel pretty fortunate about that. Um, I, and you touched on it and I hope we don't have to really belabor it, but if you don't have a CRM, gosh, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, <laughs> it's a little late in the game. Uh, preferably one with some automation would be uh, beneficial just to make sure that the reps are, are doing something. And Lars already mentioned the sales cadence and there's a way to code that in so the reps don't have to be creating their own emails on, on a one-off basis. It's just, it's just not scalable. So something with automation would be great. Um, and then I think you definitely need a capable um, voice solution. Um, there are a lot of great solutions out there. I think Lars may have the inside track on a pretty good one as well. Um, <laughs> but but something, something that obviously records calls um, that has excellent reporting and visibility, um, something that maybe has a deeper level of intelligence and that can definitely write back to the CRM so you can log activities the right way, I think is pretty critical. Um, and then I think it's definitely um, impossible to manage the business without some sort of insight or intelligence tool. Uh, so at Junk Crew, we use Domo uh, to see everything from speed to contact, like we've talked about, to, to visualize the entire sales journey. Um, definitely the number of touch points to close, the duration of the sales cycle, um, particularly where deals are being won and lost along the way is important. Um, so Domo has been super uh, powerful for us, and I, I love the way it presents my data for my teams. Um, and then I would say if, if, if you're going to make investments in sales technology, having some type of intelligence and insights tool is necessary so, so that you know what's working and what's not. Um, so, I mean, I, I consider Domo and our intelligence tools absolutely mission critical. Any other thoughts, guys? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. I, I, think, I think somewhere along the way, everybody started with this view that the CRM would be the end all be all. And I, I think yeah. as you look at a leader, right, the leader needs the data to drive the insights, to coach the folks, through ambition or whatever other products you're using to drive the right behaviors. But if you don't think of the, the rep themselves and how to make it easier for that rep to do their job, how to onboard a rep, how to, how to drive them through a process, how to keep them focused on the process and the discipline associated with that, by using automation, by capturing data, by following that prescribed process, you then enable that rep to be more successful so you're not asking them to do a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. Automation, perhaps, is one of the most overlooked opportunities that we now have both in Salesforce or in Microsoft Dynamics that you can sequence activities and outcomes after every conversation that take that rep to the next step, create a task, create a follow-up opportunity or convert a lead to an opportunity. Those are things that's part of that 70% of a sales rep's time that's doing administrative stuff. Not only do you make it easier for them, but then as a leader, you're capturing all of the information that you need in order to use a demo or use Einstein or whatever analytics tool that you have to, to make better business decisions. But if you don't make it easier for the reps, you're not going to get the consistency of data hygiene or output or engagement or productivity. Hey, Jared, do you, do you guys use Outreach IO like we do? We're huge fans. We do use Outreach. We use a number of technologies like them as well. I mean, Dallas Source is a great partner of, of ours, but basically exactly what both of you guys just said. It means having the right tools to, to take things out of the rep's job um, that ultimately are manual. And these types of tools we're talking about really kind of daisy chain this process together, making the data input more clean, hygiene easy, or hygiene accurate, making it easy for the rep, uh, which ultimately allows the manager to have a better coaching conversation. If you don't have the data, like, like Domo, that's critical. But if you don't have the right steps in the process to get to good data output in a BI tool like Domo, Right. Um, it's impossible to, to move the rep forward, uh, to move the lead forward, um, and ultimately coach the process. Which is a good segue into sort of the next, um, I think, aspect of this, which is obviously we're talking about just enabling the sales team with what they need. We're talking about having clean data so that we actually know how we're tracking. Um, but, you know, we're mid-year. We need to close deals out the end of the year. Our pipeline is down. Our numbers are down. Um, we have all the right data because we're doing the right stuff now. So how do we actually adjust goals? You know, we're talking about building pipeline in the right ways. Obviously, there's just some basic stuff that we can do day in and day out to do that for us sales and, market, sales and marketing professionals. But what do you do and how do you coach a leader to basically take a goal that was set for them at the beginning of the year, adjust that goal based on the reality that we're in and figure out how we're going to get 
what we need if we don't have what we, you know, what we projected we would have at this point. Um, and this is really just open to everyone. Like we're, we're sitting there right now. So August chips are down. What do you do? Well, how do you, how do you sort of a forecast that accurately and, and determine, are we in a good, good spot? Like, what does that look like? And what is sort of the combination of things you would recommend a manager do to, to get where, get back on track? Yeah. I mean, I always kind of describe this to my team as it's halftime. And the first half of our year, honestly, is pretty hard. Like people aren't buying necessarily like they were the previous quarter of four. They don't have as much money available. So a lot of times we are rebuilding in the second half of the year. And sometimes goals need to be readjusted. And that's really hard to do. Um, but I think rep specifically will check out and will when they don't see a path. So I think leaders need to really lean into this problem if and when it's a problem. Hopefully it's never a problem for you all. Uh, but I'll just say, you know, me, for example, yeah, you know, mid, mid year, you have to kind of have a reset and a revamp and kind of a re relaunch, if you will. So um, if there's ever a time where you're trying to coach your team to an impossible goal, change the goal. Like it's your job to, to readjust the plan and to provide a path to them having success. So, uh, Hopefully no one's in that position. Everybody's well above quota. Uh, but if and when you're not, you're behind, um, lean into that, own it, and ultimately give that person or persons a path to hitting the number because uh, it's been possible. They're, they're, they're going to check out. Yeah. But Jared, if I, if I may, the other thing that I would do is, you know, that may be a lofty goal. There's still a chance. It's only halftime, right? I mean, you could be down in the Super Bowl by a bunch and still come back and win, hypothetically. Right? Yeah. Look at the Falcons. and and. and there you go, right? But if, if you take that and then you, then you chunk that down, what were the behaviors and what were the activities and actions that drove the outcomes traditionally? Or where's the market going? What things do we see people need to focus on? If you chunk it or break it down to those things that are controllable or that an individual can affect and coach to those things, make them more efficient, make them more effective, help them be better every day, that will have a result over time. It may not happen tomorrow, but it, it, as long as it's aligned with the pentamount goal of driving additional revenue, you can, you can pull that back to individual tasks, activities, and things that are meaningful that will build upon a successful year end at halftime. I think that's yeah. exactly right. Well, and I was going to say, we had a, we had a question um, that came, came in, not here, but during registration that basically was asking, you know, is it better to, try to cater to every single rep on the team to set those goals or adjust those goals? Or is it better to set sort of an aspirational thing that, you know, your top sellers are going to be able to do to really get them fired up? Or is it better to set maybe a less ambitious goal that you do think every single person can do? I mean, I think Jared kind of touched on it with morale. You don't want to, you don't want your entire team in the Super Bowl, you know, to check out or half your team to be like, uh, we don't care. This is, this is impossible. Um, but how, how have you seen that work? I mean, what is that combination of sort of, I guess, catering to each person on the team, but also looking at just as an organization, we've all got to get to, to the next step look like. So I, I've found personally in, in my experience that if, if 80% or more, 70%, you know your business better than I do, but if the overwhelming majority of your salespeople are hitting goal, it's probably time to adjust that goal upward. Um, I, I don't think there's a, there's a, a functional business out there where, where every single salesperson is hitting goal every month. I just don't think that's the reality of it. Um, I do think there is a tricky dance between, um, you know, ambitious and achievable. And then I'm a huge fan of stretch goals. Um, I don't know of any salesperson out there who's not um, expecting for goals to change sort of in real time as you work through the year. Um, and I think that figuring out what, what motivates your team on an individual basis or a team basis really is critical. Uh, we spend a lot of time at Jump Crew taking surveys of our sales reps and figuring out what it is that motivates them. And the interesting thing about Jump Crew is that most of our team here wants a team goal. They really like to win and lose as a team. So we find people at the, at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter who are at quota, you know, chipping in to help the people who are sort of falling behind because they want to win that trip to Top Golf or they want the canoe trip or they, they, want, they want to do that with the team, which I think, you know, says a lot about culture. Um, so I think you've got a responsibility as a sales leader to figure out wh what motivates your people and then how to get them all on the same page, uh, you know, just outside of quota in general, just, just what gets them going when, you know, when the deck's sort of stacked against you mid-year. Yeah. 
Well, and obviously here at Ambition, just the nature of our business, we obviously talk about motivation, incentives, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's integral to our customer experience. So Jared, specific question for you. I mean, I think that was a great, a great segue into this one. So what are, are there different incentives that you would, I guess, dole out for a pipeline goal versus a, a revenue goal or close one goal? Do, do those things look different? Um, if you're going to do, let's say, a competition or a contest, um, is the structure of those going to be different for a, you know, generating pipeline or how does that kind of work? Um, yeah. Does it I matter? Think, well, kind of, you know, carrying this conversation together, you know, we're used to getting beat up the first half. So we need a good incentive for Q3 to come out, you know, like the Patriots in, in, the, in the, the Super Bowl I mentioned before. Um, because they're down 21 points. We, we currently, uh, we have our best incentive ever, which is the billboard contest. <laughs> where revenue focus so contest. I think Rob's probably seen two in Nashville where the top performing rep uh, in quarter three gets a billboard in their hometown of their choosing and they can put whatever they want. So, you know, we have a degenerate person who has won it the past two years <laughs> and they're, they're a diehard Vols fan and the Vols <laughs> haven't been good in 20 years since Peyton Manning left. And, uh, but it's, it's his thing and he makes it his own. And in the past two quarters, we've exceeded number on Q3 coming out of our tough half. Um, that might not be the incentive that I put out there for pipeline. Um, you know, but so it's a different incentive. It's two different things. I think as Rob mentioned, team goals and individual goals are important to align. I would probably pick a team goal for the pipeline. Hey, if we hit X, we're going to top golf or we're going skydiving or we're doing something. It kind of gives those, those 80, that 80, 20 rule, your top performers, a reason to help their peers, to get everybody kind of up to spec, to hold them accountable. I mean, they're teammates out there. So for a pipeline goal, me personally, I probably would put some sort of team incentive out there um, that allows them to bond and build and do something as a group. I mean, what about interdepartmental competitions? <laughs> I want to go to talk. <laughs> hey, Mark, marketing's got their goals. I think we, we, can, we can jazz it up. All right. I'll, this is a really valuable webinar for me to be on. I like this. <laughs> She's locking in. You're recording this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, One of the things that, that we did this year is when we looked at the overall incentive program and plan that we, I, I told you, we started by mapping out the entire customer journey or customer life cycle. And we looked at different organizations like marketing or our customer success team or our implementation team, we actually restructured the sales compensation program to make it available funds to incent our marketing partners to give us better leads, to incent the implementation teams to, to carry the ball or pick up the ball earlier in, in the process so we could focus more on the selling effort. And then for our customer success team that may have not participated as actively in net new pursuits, for them to all participate in a shared team atmosphere. So part of that's compensation. The other part really is that camaraderie, but it starts with what is the end journey? What are the outcomes and who plays in that and can get them all to buy in? And can you give them a, a nudge or an incentive or a reason to care more? Exactly. Well, and I think, again, yeah. this, this segues really well into the my last little point earlier, which is the sort of, cats and dogs, marketing and sales and, and staying aligned, you know, and I will say full disclosure, I really do think we have a wonderful sales and marketing alignment at Ambition. I feel very, very fortunate because I've definitely been in the opposite situation. Um, but, you know, obviously to, to Lars's point, it is a shared goal. Pipeline is not something that sales leaders need to to own in a vacuum or marketing needs to own in a vacuum or inbound and outbound are completely sort of agnostic or you know separate from each other um so when we see these stats that one in four teams are misaligned i kind of just want to open up the floor and ask why do you think that is why what are the where is that breakdown is it in process is it communication um, and then what are some of the solutions why are why are we why are we not talking or what do you think the crux of sort of the misunderstanding is because i don't you know i don't think it's because we're just different people most marketing people or salespeople have done that both jobs at some point um so what what do you think it is why why are we misaligned what are the very specific points in which you think um marketing could be more helpful when it comes to generating pipeline and um yeah just tell, lay it on me i want to learn 
Well, I think that's that's one of the big things that Jumker really focuses on is, you know, we identified, everybody knows there's this classic misalignment of, of sales and marketing where, you know, marketing's chief KPI is number of leads driven. Sales is obviously revenue focused. Sales is looking at marketing and saying your leads are terrible. Marketing's looking at sales and going, yeah, but you don't know how to close and <laughs> nothing happens, right? So, so what we did is we, we sort of tried to, to blend the machine there. So there's, there's the feedback loop. And I think that feedback loop is, is absolutely critical where, where, Sales is a responsibility to report back to marketing. You know, these 10 leads were great. I want 100 more just like them. And these five are terrible. And this is why I don't ever want to see those again. And then marketing <laughs> has an obligation to, 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 to internalize that feedback and to put it into practice and use that to make informed decisions about future, future marketing initiatives. Because in my experience, when marketing and sales are talking uh, and they're working really well in, in, in harmony, they're really in sync. Um, you don't have to worry so much about your top of the funnel. Like that problem is sort of taking care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the leads are better. Sales is happier. You're closing quicker. You know, your clients are happier. So, so you know, I, I, it's a classic problem. I, I don't know why we can't solve it. Jump Crew is working on it. But uh, I'd love to know what Lars and Jared think about it. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is an age-old tale. I think in bigger companies, it's a bigger problem. Yes. Like big number here, big number here. There's a lot of infighting. Yeah. Um, if you're not that big company and you can control it, I mean, control it, like your partners in this thing. Yeah. But I think it's, I mean, like for us, like sales is closest to the problem. If you're not sharing what you're hearing from prospects live, if you're not agile enough to go across the aisle mm -hmm. and talk to marketing about the, what message is resonating or what, what new title is now really interested, you're going to, that's, that's when you get that infighting. So mm -hmm. I think it's, partnering together to say, what are we trying to do? Obviously we're trying to close business and get more leads, but who are those leads? What are their problems right now? Where are they coming from? Sales has all those answers. And if yeah. they're providing marketing with the right information, marketing can sharpen the pencil and they can be more effective and they can get more leads and more better leads. Yeah. So I think it's, it's leaning into, uh, you know, yes, you two drive each other. Don't think of them as enemies. Think of them right. as partners and really share what's working and when what isn't working. Like, like we talked about earlier, the unqualified leads, get them out. Why are they unqualified? Where'd they come from? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's not market there anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's just getting tighter together. That, yeah. I think there's Agreed. simply three things. One is marketing should be aligned to the revenue goal in my opinion, right? If you can agree that the outcome of everybody in this customer life cycle is to deliver revenue, that's number one. Two is, to make sure you capture the data because data has power. So you know if that was a good campaign or not a good campaign. So you have to make it easy for the reps to capture that data. And then you simply have to have a conversation, right? Get around the table, look at the information you have and make better decisions. It's that simple. I think there's just simply three things there. I love it. And I agree. Um, one last point on that though. You know, I do think getting around a table is, I mean, that's great. What are all of the, or, I guess rather, rather, what channels do you see being really effective for kind of that daily visibility into what the other teams are doing? Um, I think that that is something I've seen be a huge problem. We don't talk about it until it's like, you know, the once a month meeting or something like that. Um, what are some of those solutions? What are ways that you've seen teams, sales and marketing teams really work well together on a sort of daily, weekly basis? I have teams here where, where sales and marketing actually get in a room once a week and review, you know, the previous week's inbound leads. And they, they you know, they spend, they've got a working sheet and they, they throw leads in there and they red light, green light them. And then they make some notes and we get in the same room and we talk about it. Um, I find that when there's that type of communication, it, it, it's not competitive or, you know, it's not, no one's getting their feelings hurt because, because we're sitting here working towards the same goal. So here's what went really well. And I'm really proud of this and I'm happy about it. And here's what didn't go so well. Can we work together to figure out why it's not? Cool. Get in a room guys. Let's hash it out. Let's figure it out. Um, Get in the ring. Get in the ring. <laughs> no, that's so violent. Um, all right. So kind of the last, last bit. So we've solved all the problems. Sales and marketing are aligned. We're going to sit in a room every week. We're going to talk. We have processes in place. Um, we all agree that the goals are, you know, they're this or that, and we either need to adjust them or, you know, what have you. Um, but what are some what are some additional sort of plus ones that you've seen be really effective when it comes to building pipeline, especially when the chips are down? I know, Jared, we've talked about this in the past. You know, just I I feel like at Ambition specifically, we have a really open culture of 
if you've got an idea and you want to go for it, let's chat about it and go, go see what happens. But specifically, I'll start with Jared. Like, what are some fun creative tactics that you feel our sales team has, has used to hustle and get it done? <clears throat> yeah, I think a bunch of things come to mind. One more recent one is probably one of our reps in Austin. He's, you know, he's sitting down there. He's, he's having a hard time getting through, you know, normal channels, phone and email, even with interesting prospects. Guess what? It's hard to get in touch with them, even if they want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, I think he felt, you know, we have a culture of empowerment, obviously. So I think he felt, Hey, I'm just going to show up this person's office. So, so I'm not saying this is going to work for everybody, but Eric didn't have to ask for permission. He knew, you know, he'd be supported by his leadership and, you know, he showed up at a guy's office who had talked to him and, um, lo and behold, that person wasn't expecting him. He walks over, he's like, Hey, Bob, or whatever the manager's name was, he managed an SDR team and immediately stands up whole, whole team, 30 SDRs there. This is what I'm talking about. This is what y'all <laughs> need to be doing to make this happen. So I think it's be creative and empower your teams, obviously within reason to yeah. do what they need to do to, to be successful. You have to be, I always say, be a human. Like no one wants to talk to the email that they get constantly. <laughs> right. Make sure you're connecting with them. And, and, and Eric, the, the, the rep I mentioned here, felt that he had the creative control to go affect this because um, what he was doing wasn't working. And that guy gave him a 30 minute impromptu meeting in the office and then talked to his team about how they should be doing things like that. Yeah. So I think it's empowering your team to, to go the extra mile and maybe giving them examples like that if they're not yeah. understanding what the extra mile looks like. And don't get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? Do you have any, any examples <clears throat> similar Hustle. Mine, mine, aren't as, mine aren't as creative or, or fun, but I, I really think that um, just making sure reps have enough visibility in, into, into what's working and what's not, particularly around, um, you know, inbound leads and speed to first contact. So I had um, uh, one of my, you know, excellent valued colleagues in, in operations rolled out a new dashboard the other day for one of my sales teams that shows, you know, all the inbound metrics. So, so they really have a sense of, of where their revenue is coming from and, and whether or not they're being attentive to the leads in the way that we consider to be critical. Um, and I feel like um, a lot of times they drop the ball and it's, it's not, it's not their fault. But it's probably my fault because I haven't given them the tools to, to visualize what they're doing every day and to ensure that they're doing things the right way. So I find that just giving them, you know, unbridled access to dashboards and reporting that, that let them know if they're doing the right things or not, uh, particularly when times get tough, you know, is, is really important. Um, I'm also not afraid to throw a happy hour when I think you know, dashboards <laughs> are meaningful. <laughs> that is effective for me at least. Um, okay. Well, we, we don't have a ton of time left and I do want to get to some really good questions that we got from people. So Lars, you're up, you're up, buddy. Uh, Jordan um, from Checker had a question and he said, cold email and call cadence strategies. Um, you know, what, it, what does that look like? What are, what are your recommendations there? He specifically is like, is it five emails over 10 days, one month, 20? What does that combination look like? He wants to get really tactical. Um, yeah. So what do, you, what do you think when it comes to it really depends, in my opinion, on the lead source. So one of the things we're working with marketing to do is we, we get leads from multiple different areas. We have a separate cadence for inbound leads for a specific uh, vertical market. We have a different cadence pre and post events, and that can even be shaped if it's ALSD, a sporting event, or AISP, or Associated Inside Sales Professionals. Those, those cadence are, are defined based on who the target prospect is, what, you know, what we expect as an outcome of that investment. So they can vary. The, the, the flexibility now in the market in, in different tools that are available like dial sources, you can create a cadence within minutes and you can add content to that that's relevant literally within minutes. It's no longer this full bone structured, it, it take, I, this effort's gonna take me three days to prepare for this whole thing. It's like, no, okay, let's get together. Mm -hmm. Who are we talking to? What's our message? How often do we want to communicate with them? Is it a smaller, small to medium business or somebody we want to touch five times? Fine. How many emails is that? Is there text message associated with that? Is there voicemail? Is there voicemail we want to create? Or how many phone calls do we make? You know, we go as much as 21 touches and as few as five. So the flexibility now and the tools that are available can be leveraged if there's clear communication between marketing and sales. There's no single answer. 
to be candid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Jamie's thunder. Um, <laughs> looks like Naresh just had I, I, I was just I knew you were. You knew I was. I think um, large today in setting is perfect. But yeah. Yeah, there isn't, I mean, like we're all looking for silver bullets. I do think Lars's answer is perfect. I mean, we approach it at, at Ambition very similarly, but Naresh does have a good question just about what's a good average time between emails specifically um, from your perspective. I mean, I have nerdy email marketing thoughts, but you know, if you don't know what you're dealing with and you're test testing something for the first time, you don't have data to back up what works, where would you start? What would you recommend? Good question. You know, I, I, it depends. One to three days is really what we set up. But it, it's it's no longer a single channel of communication. It's no longer yeah. just email. Email's dead. It's video, right? It's email. It's text. It's voice, voicemail, voice call. And, and, and you can structure all those now into one approach, one cadence. We, we generally suggest one to three days. But sometimes in that one day, you'll drop an email and a voicemail mm -hmm. or an email and a phone call. So it's really about the structure and also is it a enterprise customer that's of a senior level that you know you're you may want to touch them twice a week and that's the max if not it becomes a, it, you know it becomes almost inflammatory so yeah. <laughs> you, you, really, you really need to be thoughtful about who you're going to and what message you have and and how receptive they are to that message but there again just like there is no clear definition of how many times you need to engage somebody before you walk away. That's going to be somewhere they say between 12 and now 18 touches, mm -hmm. but it could be as few as five if you're really just getting in and out for a particular event or one particular um, engagement. Well, and this topic leads us to our next question in a really clear way, which Thomas had a question just about what's the role of SMS. And I think this, I would argue email is not dead, but to Lars's point, Correctly, a multi-channel approach, email cannot do it by itself. Phone can't do it by itself. In-person can't do it by itself. You've got to have everything kind of playing in concert together. So where does SMS lie in this? Um, and just texting, not, ma not SMS as a marketing channel, but as like a, hey, buddy, what's up? Um, how do you guys use it? Do you use it? What are your thoughts on it? Lars, I'd be curious to punt to you first. Um, cause I think you have a unique kind of a, approach and an understanding of, of whether or not this is working earlier in the process. You know, I, I don't believe SMS <clears throat> while it's a function and people are accustomed to it. Those that you have relationships with, like Jared, the, the opportunity that we, we were working on most recently, as that opportunity evolves and the communication becomes on the regular text is very well received by both parties and, and a really effective mm -hmm. communication vehicle. Early in on the marketing side or the early prospecting side where there's not that defi defined relationship, my experience has been customers are not as <laughs> accepting of receiving text messages from strangers. But once you're right. no longer a stranger, it's super powerful. But that, <laughs> that again, does not have to be clearly defined as well. It's, you know, Jared, you and I text, right? I mean, but we also text the same prospects and customers, but that wasn't, I can tell you, through the marketing engine or mm -hmm. early in the sales stage or sales process, mm -hmm. it was once that relationship was established that it became the, the go-to form of communication for immediate answers and updates. Yeah. So it has a it has a role, but in my opinion, that's further down in the sales engagement or relationship mm -hmm. process. So I didn't want to I didn't want to negate anything, which is why I asked you to go first. But I agree one hundred percent with Lars. Um, I actually have a rule like pipeline it's not a real opportunity until you're texting like you you have to it, at, in today for at least our business you've got to have the ability to text your your champions and your buyers and if you don't you're probably not their vendor of choice in the process you have to have that relationship but mm -hmm. the marketing side it's probably way too early to text yeah. i would not recommend it um, that relationship Lars is talking about is critical and it, i think you have to be able to mm -hmm. know someone and be relational before you go to SMS. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would totally agree with you. I think you can use text as a marketing channel as a transactional piece, but not as a, hey, what you, what's up? <laughs> this is me. Are you going to be at the meeting tomorrow? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> too soon, too soon. Um, okay, we probably have time maybe for two more, but let's, let's see. Let's, what's a good one here? Um, 
Okay, actually, I like this one. I have this one assigned to everyone. Um, Ed wants to know, what are just the latest trends and prospecting methods? Um, so we just talked about, hey, maybe don't just randomly text <laughs> people you don't know very well. Uh, imagine that. I think any woman on earth would tell you that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what, what are some trends? What are some methods um, that you guys see when it comes to just cold outreach? Because we do know that is the, that's just the hardest thing to do. Nobody wants to really do that. I'll jump in here. Um, so prospects are smarter than ever. Um, they already know yeah. who you are, even if you don't know that they're looking at you. Mm -hmm. So when they engage, I think you have to, you have to be, you have to know who you're talking to and why, why you're talking to them, but ultimately why they're talking to you, like solve their problems. Don't talk about your product in that discovery and that first touch. They're already 60 plus percent of the way of buying a solution, especially if, you know, if they're coming inbound. Mm -hmm. So be careful with qualification. Like obviously you have to qualify. That's critical, but focus in on the pain. Why are they talking to you? And, and what are they, what have they found? What are they looking to learn next in the process? Don't try to sell them out of the gate. Um, that will be a turnoff because they're very knowledgeable. They've read G2 crowd. They've on Captera. They know what's up. They know what your customers think about you. So open it up to them. What are you here to learn? Not can I schedule a meeting with you? solve their problems and um, you're more likely to build that relationship Lars and I are talking mm -hmm. about and, and building the permission to text them in the process later. That's my thoughts. I, um, we, we've taken a, a sort of an account based marketing approach these days at Joan crew. We, we've got a great inbound funnel, but we also have a really good sense of who our ideal customer is. So we identified, you know, the top, you know, five or six, 700 customers, you know, businesses, companies out there that we know, we're a great fit for. Uh, and anecdotally, I can tell you, we have a very high success rate with sending donuts to people. So, you know, for, for what oh, it's worth, for what it's worth, sending food is working right now. Here's I'll let deal. you know when it, uh, I'll That's let you know, know when it stops. <laughs> I love it. I, like, I'm, I'm like offline, tell me everything. I'm like, direct mail, how fun. Anyway, go ahead. Pretty funny. <laughs> you know, I would add to that is, it's events like this, it's, it's thought leadership. So when I started with Dial Source, you know, we were really a heavy tech led sales engagement model, or we, we had that and really pulled it back up to share some of the experience. Right? As we spent, I spent quite a bit of time in the sales industry and in the tech industry, and we moved it to things that are relevant for many, like this webinar, like digital sales transformation, and mm -hmm. sharing a common story that everybody can relate to. Because, you know, there are many tools out there, but you don't you don't look at purchasing a tool until you've got your objectives, until you've got your sales process, until you have the right people. Do you start looking at a solution because you simply don't know what you're trying to solve for until you have that foundation in place? So spending time with webinars like this or events and thought leadership to, to engage and get the right inbound engagement and then simply when it becomes just straight up cold calling, you just got to have better conversations. You got to be able to listen to calls and coach your reps on having yeah. better conversations and more compelling events that are focused on not your product, to your point, Jared, but to the solutions you solve and the outcomes you deliver for your customers. Yeah. I always like to say to our, especially from an outbound motion, know who you're calling and why you're calling them. If you can't answer those yeah. two questions, you're not going to solve my problem. <laughs> when I answer a cold call. So just yeah. know that like you're here there. Like I only talk to you if I'm on the receiving end, if you're solving something that's currently a pain point. So yeah. do deep discovery, understand what your solution solves for. Don't talk about the features. Talk about the problems you're solving with those features. Totally. Yep. Guys, I could talk about this stuff all day or I could listen to you talk about it all day. This is really fascinating. I think it's really helpful. I hope that everyone on the line enjoyed it, learned something, uh, got some actionable takeaways. We'll send the recording. Uh, Rob, I know, has something to, to tell us about JumpCon. <laughs> I didn't really talk about that. That was a terrible. You really, you really set me up for that one. Yeah. That was great. Rob has right. something to tell you now. Um, go ahead. But we yeah. will send the information he's about to tell you in an email as well. But. So shameless plug, uh, Jump Crew is very <laughs> excited to announce that we are launching uh, the first ever digital sales transformation summit, uh, where we're going to talk uh, a lot about what we're talking about now, you know, strategies to acquire new customer, customers being in your buyer's path, 
um, you know, digital uh, lead generation as it relates to sales, the alignment of sales and marketing, you know, all, everything we talked about today. Um, we're hosting it in Nashville, Tennessee, where our headquarters is. It's on October 24th uh, of this year, 2019. We've got some awesome speakers. Um, Rand Fishkin, the founder of Moz, um, arguably the godfather of SEO. Alden Mills, ex-Navy SEAL, invented the perfect push-up, if you know what that is. Oh. Uh, so there'll be a lot of people there talking about sales uh, and how to integrate sales and marketing to grow um, brand awareness and revenue. Uh, they'll be signing and giving away books and all sorts of stuff. So we got speakers from Twitter, Salesforce, Outreach, IO, Sales Hacker, iHeartMedia, on and on. Um, so for everybody on the webinar, uh, and Jamie, I think you're going to send out a, a follow-up email with this. Okay, awesome. So for everybody on the <laughs> webinar, um, there's there's a code. Uh, the code is uh, ambition to get 35% uh, off your tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. The first 10 people will get um, to register will get invited to the VIP networking mixer the night before. Mm -hmm. That's right, Jamie. You can come too. Lars, Jared, you should come. We'd <laughs> love to have you guys. <laughs> it's it's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. If you haven't been to Nashville, it's a, it's a party city, so yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun. But um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, shamelessly plug the event. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll we'll all be at the mixer too. Um, Lars, you're invited as well. I'm um, coming. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, Lars is coming. Um, awesome. Yeah, so we're all going to be there. Surprise! We'll send you that information. Um, we are hosting something the day before for our own customers. So if you're a customer, more to come on that. We'll spread the word out there for all you guys and get that in your inboxes as well as this recording. But let us know if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, have a good day. May your okay. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Bye. Thank you, folks. Enjoyed it. Lars, <laughs> I have a shirt envy right now. <laughs> it's Hawaiian Friday. <laughs> There's really good shirts on this. It's Hawaiian Friday. Aloha. Okay. Aloha. 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 See you later. <laughs>